Welcome to the Happy Homeschooler podcast, a digital support group for everyone interested in a learning lifestyle. I'm your host, Melody. I'm your co-host, Holly. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about penmanship and cursive and typing. But before we get into our topic, let's catch up a little bit. How have you been since we last talked? I've um, been doing pretty well and getting used to my middle son no longer living with us. He moved out at the um, early part of September, and it's been interesting to now be a family of three. Um, we make less coffee, and we, <laughs> we, we do some things differently because we don't have a fourth member in the household, and it's, it's kind of weird. I bet it is weird. We're fixing to face something similar. Our household is going to, we're changing households. My husband and I will be uh, moving and my adult daughter and son who live with us now are moving somewhere else. And uh, we're just having a little bit of a hard time figuring out how to, you know, who takes what stuff and how that's going to change everything. And We've been joking with my daughter. She's lived with us, you know, for 22 years all her life. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, that's going to be very different. Just it's like when anyone is away for a weekend or something, suddenly it seems so quiet without them. Yeah, the whole tenor of the household changes. And even though my son um, worked full time and so he was gone a lot or uh, sometimes he would go into work uh, like at 2 a.m. So he'd be sleeping during the day and we didn't really interact not having him here has really changed things and it's kind of interesting one nice thing though is um i have been telling him so he lives with his oldest brother and um, his oldest brother is not a good communicator in fact i never hear from him unless i text him or i run into him at the store where he works our, our local grocery <laughs> store and so um i have i said i hope that you don't go off the grid when you move out and i never hear from you like your brother and, He's been very diligent to check in with me and um, and text me every so often. And it's been very nice because I know he's making an effort and that just warms my heart. Oh, that's very sweet and very helpful. I know we, even our adult children, we're still the mama heart watching over them. Yeah, my happiest days are if I've heard from all of my kids by a text or a phone call or a, you know, a little message or something on Facebook. If I hear from everybody in one day, I'm just like, oh, this is great. I feel the same way. I yep. sure do. I hope our kids are listening and they know how much we love them. <laughs> we'll tag them in the episode. <laughs> right. All, all that homeschooling, you know, we, we still love them. So we do. And, and like the schooling part of our relationship came to an end, but the relationship keeps going. Exactly. We grew our own good friends. Oh, I like the way you said that. That's really good. <laughs> So let's get into our topic. We're going to talk about penmanship and cursive and typing, like I mentioned. And we do want to make a distinction that we're talking about the physical act of, you know, holding a pencil or a pen or a writing instrument and moving it around and making marks on paper, uh, not composition, but actual like printing or manuscript. Right. Yeah. If you say writing, it gets a little nebulous, but if you want to be writing, you have to be doing something people can read. And so good penmanship is very important. We tend to think of penmanship as writing letters to write words. But just over the years, I've come to realize it really starts when your children first start trying to imitate writing or even when they're picking up a pencil or a crayon to draw. Like in the beginning, everybody uses like, you know, the caveman grip with a, a right. fist. Uh -huh. and they're writing but at some point they need to transition over into that typical correct pencil like that pincher grip where you can hold your writing instrument in the correct way so that you reduce stress on the hand and things like that but i've been working with some children recently that i've noticed because they I guess we could call it immature ways of holding their pencil they're having a very hard time forming letters correctly mm. yeah i think that um there are things we can do to help children to develop that little pincer grip, you can have them pick up things with their thumb and their finger, um, little tiny things. And it's developmental too. You know, most two-year-olds don't have the ability to do that. Although some advanced children do start picking up a pencil and actually can start writing. But, but it's developmental and there are things you can do to encourage that grip besides just teaching them how to do it, but giving them activities to use that grip 
in other ways. You know, one of the things that we did to help the little ones practice that correct grip was to use those small pieces of chalk that ordinarily I would toss out, but they're so small it forces you to use a, a pincher grip. And um, my we had a chalkboard that was on the wall, which is another good thing that so that they were writing, standing up as well as sitting down. And uh, way back then, the chalk would create so much dust, I kind of hated it. And I always gave somebody the job of sweeping or mopping up the floor afterward. But now there is dustless chalk. And so I would encourage moms to find a way to hang a chalkboard and let your kids practice writing that way. And it was fun because that chalkboard hung in our dining room area and we would write little notes to each other on the chalkboard. Oh, that does sound like a lot of fun. And and kids like to write notes. And it's even more important if the notes can be read, (laughs) which which underscores the importance of making sure that we teach good penmanship because it's very frustrating to try to read something that's illegible. Yes, it is. And even if you allow for some slight differences in handwriting, you still need to make your letters in the way that is the standard so that people know those letters. I had to grade some spelling tests recently where uh, some of the students would tell me that's just the way I write my letter. Like, <laughs> and, like, oh, well, no, you silly child. It doesn't really look like the letter A. You're going to have to be careful in class to write that in a way that I can that I can read. But I understand that because I have a son who has some interesting ways of forming his letters like you're supposed to start your letters at the top but some of his start on the line and it was one of those things we kind of butted heads over for a while until I realized that it was still very legible so people could read what he meant you could understand what he was talking about but it does matter it it is so frustrating to try to read something when you have to spend your time deciphering what the word says instead of enjoying the flow of the person's thoughts Right. And, you know, I I think a lot of people have doubts about handwriting in the modern era. However, I used to work in real estate and we had people um, fill out applications and they had to fill them out by hand. And I cannot tell you how many times I couldn't read what was written. And also, you know, yes, we do use uh, all sorts of devices to communicate. But there are many times when we may not have those devices and we have to write something on a piece of paper. And so um, good printing and nice cursive handwriting are skills that all people should be taught. Oh, I absolutely agree. And this is probably a a good time to just mention that um, we, we did have a death in the family and I have received some very sweet cards from friends. And there is an element of open opening the mailbox to see a note, you know who it's from before you even open it because you recognize that handwriting. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of those instances where while I appreciate the the digital notes that I got just as much, having those other handwritten notes uh, in my hands, it was just a different layer of care and concern that that conveyed. And it was it was really sweet to get those notes. And so I knew we were going to be talking about handwriting at some point. And so as I'm reading these different letters and uh, recognizing the, the handwriting, it was was kind of nice to realize that really it does make a difference. And some of these are people I've known a long time and their handwriting has been the same for years and years. And it's, it's as distinctive as a fingerprint. Yes, it is. It really is. I know there's a whole uh, area of study for that. Um, Yeah, the study of handwriting is called paleography, and it's really interesting because it can kind of pinpoint a period in time when something was written by the style of the writing. I think it's fascinating. Oh, I just remember that my grandmother and all of her sisters, so my great aunts, all had very similar handwriting that was very different from the way that my siblings and I were being taught cursive, that's what I'm talking about. Cursive handwriting, just it was still very recognizable, easy to read, but just the way they formed their letters was completely different from what we were being taught at the time. So that's part of that paleography where depending on what time you live in, that's going to influence the kind of handwriting that you do. And where you were living. So I'm sure that people in England, their cursive writing at a certain era 
looks different from someone in another country. My grandmother, um, she wrote the Spencerian style handwriting, which isn't that popular anymore, although you can still find worksheets and instructional materials for it. It's gorgeous. And yeah, so it's really interesting when you look at things that people have written from other times at how uh, different they are. Right. And that's one of those goes back to why it's important, why penmanship is important. We need to be able to read things that people have written out of our time, uh, founding documents and things like that, that we want to be able to access. I had one child who was pretty sure that he was never going to be able to read that fancy writing. And then once we broke it down as he was learning, realized that those were still recognizable as the letters. And for some reason to him, that was like mysterious. Mm hmm. <laughs> Fancy grown up writing. I've seen jokes like, you know, if you want someone, if you want to write something in code, just write in cursive, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> True. Uh, let's talk a little bit then about how we want to introduce penmanship to our students and to our children. What do you like? I guess we want to start with preparing your toddlers and your preschoolers for writing. Yeah, you know, there's some different schools of thought about don't let them use. Uh, markers or don't let them use a certain tool. Pens are not a good first tool to give to a child when they're learning to do any kind of writing. So I always started with a pencil. Um, mm -hmm. Me too. Cause, yeah, because crayons, they, they require a lot of pressure to to write with. So we always started with a pencil, kind of a chunky pencil that was bigger, you know, gave the kids an easier way to hold it. And just simple things. Um, usually it started with they wanted to write their name or they wanted to write something that was going on in the house, like the dog barked or, you know, my youngest daughter, she liked to write and she was writing little books when she was six. So we had a lot of writing that happened outside of, you know, a lot of her printing experience was outside of actual lessons. Uh, but I think that's a good example of how just real life activities can be your lessons because there's a lot of handwriting and uh, creativity going on when you're writing your own book. But we did the same thing. We wrote with pencil and paper and sometimes kind of a rough paper like we had. Um, like newsprint. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of feedback, sensory feedback with that. And then chalk, like I mentioned, and for some of them later on, once they had mastered the basics, I did allow markers because we had some like markers. You get a lot of bang for your book. You don't have to press very hard, although they do press hard. So you, have to, mm -hmm. like, all, you had to be responsible with the marker to be able to to write with it. But just to learn some of that control if they were having trouble with holding the pencil too hard and things like mm -hmm. that, something that you didn't have to press down very hard. You got a lot of result from your from your strokes, so you could see what you were writing. But we also, besides like crayons, markers, and writing tools, we did a lot of things, games, where you're just things like playing catch or playing with mazes or dot to dot activities and all of those kind of things that you do just to learn active. pencil control. Mm -hmm. Right, to learn control, playing games, moving your little markers around, and then not actually writing, but just all of the things you do with letters in your daily life so that they recognize what their end result, what the goal is. We're writing these letters so that we can read what we've written. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of games with letters and words and yeah a some, lot of free writing skills thank um, you that's the word i was looking for yeah. even writing in the air you know can you write your letters in the air and if i write this letter on your back do you can you figure out what it is and things like that mm -hmm. or pouring some cornmeal on a tray and letting them write with their finger in the cornmeal all of those things get that um brain to finger memory going that muscle memory of you know this letter goes this way and this letter goes that way right multi-sensory way to teach that and then when they put the pencil to paper they they know what they're doing right and that's that's really what we want because anything that's those motion those hand-eye coordination where you tell in the brain where to put the hand like any skill the more often you do it the stronger it gets and the more automatic which is what we're, our goal is, so that when they're writing, they're not having to think about how to form each letter. That's why we want to practice those things enough to where they're not thinking about the actual physical act, but they can get their words 
Yeah, I have a funny story about that. So I'm teaching uh, my son cursive this year. But of course, all of the things that he wants to write, if he's trying to write me a note, he's using manuscript. So a lot of times when I'm working, he views that as an opportunity to try to get some TV time. And he ran into my office yesterday and he had a piece of paper and it had a word and it was it started with an ED and it had some other letters I couldn't recognize. And then under it had TV and I waved him off. Um, and then later on, when I got off my phone call, I said, what was that you were writing? And he said, I was trying to write educational. Oh, <laughs> and I said, oh, well, it's a big word. And that's not at all how it's spelled. But your letters were formed very nicely. <laughs> oh, that's such a good example. Yeah, so he's he was trying to use his manuscript writing to communicate, and um, and so you know that's the goal, right? We want to be able to communicate and give our kids the opportunity to communicate in a written format. So you know, within the the printed form of writing, there are so many different styles. I think it's really important to choose a style of printing that will segue nicely into cursive writing. What kind of printing did you teach your children, Melody? Oh, well, we started out, um, actually, my favorite, this is not what I started with, but my favorite curriculum, so to speak, was handwriting without tears. So it is a not ball and stick where you're picking up your pencil after, like, the ball and pick it up and do the stick. But it was connected printing, I guess is Mm -hmm. what you would call it, which tends to be the way that we all end up writing after we've learned the, the way that we were taught, where you're drawing that little ball and you're picking up your pencil and you're adding that line to make, I don't know, a letter D. But with handwriting without tears, it was connected. And so you would, that was a magic C letter and you'd make the magic C and then your pencil would go all the way up, you know, twice as tall and then slide down the pole and make that letter D. And so for us, that was so effective with one son in particular who did not enjoy writing and had very messy handwriting. His handwriting improved tremendously where it was legible with that program because it was very broken down, very easy, very simple steps, very short lessons, which was really important to us. So we we did use that very simplified type of manuscript style. And then the only transition they really needed to make was learning to slant it a little bit and learning how to connect those letters. But that kind of went back to why you start your letters at the top. It's so that those connections can be formed easily. Um, but that son doesn't really like to write in cursive, so it didn't turn out to be a deal breaker for him. <laughs> but I did love that really simple handwriting. And then we we practiced a lot writing small letters, little notes to people, or they would help write the grocery list or whatever. So the real test of it was whether or not someone could read what you had written. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you might have used the same program did you have another favorite no i did not use handwriting without oh okay tears. yeah i i've used several um i used a becca's materials when i first got started which is ball and stick and then um we used italic the getty dube and mm-hmm. program and that was quite nice and it makes for a very pretty hand and now i am using um a reason for writing and so that's more um, ball and stick and then just transition to a more traditional cursive. And I don't think, I think that the ones where, you know, your basic print turns into cursive with just the addition of a few connecting strokes is really um, a smart way to go. Um, I chose a reason for writing because it has really short lessons. And I have um, a guy with a short attention span and I'm a Charlotte Mason homeschooler. And so I, I think that fit all my boxes. But I, I really do have to say I favor the italic um, the most of all. Right. My main concern was, was it legible? And so I've seen um, several approaches to that. Then I have some children who went on and decided they enjoyed handwriting and wanted to explore calligraphy. So uh, some of my artist children are doing, well, the, writing the letters has become drawing the letters. And so... Mm-hmm just a little bit different kind of a of an approach, I guess. Yeah, it's important to pick something and be consistent with it so that you're not needlessly confusing your students. So if you, yeah, um, so. yeah, so that, I think that's the most important thing. And if you can find one that segues nicely into cursive, that's a little easier on your kids. But ultimately, 
you know, it's not a deal breaker to go from ball and stick to cursive and, and people can handle that just fine. So it's just important that it's legible, like you said. And one last thought about printing. When I was teaching my first five kids, at that time I thought, well, is cursive really something that's important? My husband doesn't have the nicest cursive writing and his printing is uh, a little hard to read sometimes. So I stressed teaching my kids to print neatly because, you know, forms say things like, please print. But then I had to teach them all to write a signature in cursive because signatures are cursive. So I've changed my thinking and I now really do believe that cursive writing is important and I'm teaching it to my son. I, I've changed my thinking on it. I think that I um, have always been in that cursive is important camp, but um, you make a good point. I just, for us, we always kind of waited a little bit. They needed to have some good manuscript writing before I would let them start writing in cursive, but they would always start connecting letters in a pretty interesting way before we would get there. And so I had to learn to like, you know, if you're going to start writing, let me teach you the right way to do it. And so there's definitely room for both printing and cursive and then keyboarding, which we want to talk about in the next half of our program. But before we do, we're going to take a short break to hear a word from our sponsor. There's a chill in the air. Colorful lights brighten the neighborhood and the shopping malls bustle with activity. It's the end of the year, and that means it's a perfect time to make a transcript for your high school student. Having to do a bunch of laborious calculations at an already busy time is like getting a lump of coal in your stocking. That's why Transcript Maker calculates GPA for you. Just enter the grades and credits for your student, and the grade point average appears on the transcript. It's just like magic. Delivering gifts all over the world in a flying sleigh? Transcript Maker keeps your transcript in the cloud so you can access it anywhere you need it, even in a chimney. Only 12 days of Christmas? Transcript Maker offers a 14-day free trial so you can check it out for yourself before you subscribe. And listeners of the Happy Homeschooler podcast can save 20% off their subscription with our exclusive coupon code, HAPPY. That's H-A-P-P-Y in all caps. Ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, Merry Transcripts. Welcome back to the podcast. In our first half, we talked about the importance of penmanship and legible handwriting and how to introduce penmanship and handwriting to your children. In the second half, we want to move into the importance of cursive and how to teach cursive and the importance of typing and keyboarding and ideas to help you introduce that to your household. So first of all, let's just talk really quickly, you know, by learning to write in cursive, students pick up the ability to read it too. And I always felt like that improved literacy because they could read a wider range of things than they were able to read before. Yeah, and you know, um, cursive writing has a lot of other benefits, one of which is that it's got less hand fatigue. It does, and I think that in the beginning, when they're learning, they're not sure they would believe that because they're focusing so intently on what to do. Mm -hmm. But you can, by learning to write in cursive, you do, uh, you can take notes more quickly and more legibly, like in a class, if you don't have a keyboard to work with, you can jot down notes really quickly with cursive. That's true. And some people actually start with cursive writing. And one reason they do that is that it avoids the letter reversal that's common in printing. I think that's a really good reason, especially if you find a student. That's a good reason to transition to if you have someone that's doing a lot of reversals. That would be a good time to go ahead and switch over into cursive. Mm -hmm. I was reading on the Scholastic blog some of the other benefits of cursive writing and um, there was a study at the Université de Montréal that says that children who have cursive writing practice might have a boost to their reading and writing skills, one of which is that it might help them to become a better speller, which I found very interesting. Uh, now, I've always liked writing in cursive, and I'm an excellent speller. I don't know, but maybe the two of those are, you know, linked. Maybe and so. Yeah, and it, and it also says that children will likely be able to form words more easily because cursive encourages kids to visualize each letter as one united word. And I thought, oh, that's real interesting because they're connected. Oh, that is interesting. That kind of goes to where I saw something about um, a connection between writing in cursive and learning a musical instrument of, in terms of the parts of the brain that were 
activated because of the sensation, the movement, and you have to kind of plan ahead the next thing that's the next letter that's coming up mm -hmm. to connect your letters correctly. And there was some study I read about, they did brain imaging with children were writing in cursive that it activates multiple at multiple areas of the brain at once. So I that's wonder if fascinating. that's connected to the spelling. Maybe so. It, and this study also said that um, kids who write in cursive don't just form words more easily, but they also write better sentences. And that is because they have a better understanding of how words should be organized and combined to craft phrases and more complex sentence structure. Wow, that's so interesting. I'd like to, you'll have to share that. Uh, yeah, we'll have that. <laughs> I have to put yeah. that in the notes. We'll have a link to that blog in the show notes. And in that, there's a link to that study. But I thought, that's fascinating. I just remember when I was a kid and we had to learn cursive writing, my whole thing about writing nicely was so I could get my paper on the board. Oh, <laughs> I, I wanted to have I wanted to have nice enough handwriting that my paper would go up on the board. Go Thankfully, the homeschool line. students don't have those kind of societal pressures. <laughs> right. For some, that's highly motivating. And for some, that could just be, you know, high anxiety. Right. But so. it's important. I, and like I said, in the first half, I didn't think cursive was that big of a deal. And I didn't stress it that much with my first kids. But after reading some about cursive and, and the impact of it, I really do feel it's a worthwhile pursuit and that we all should be um, teaching cursive to our kids. And in the process of of teaching my son cursive, I have noticed that some of my own letter formation has gotten kind of sloppy. And my, my youngest daughter has started a, a letter writing campaign with members of us in the family. And so um, I'm writing in cursive and sending letters off to her and getting letters back from her. And it's, it's making me work on my own penmanship. So um, cursive should not be dismissed lightly. Right, I think it has value. And then like we just mentioned those studies, it can improve uh, dexterity and fine motor skills and the whole the whole uh, gamut of visual tactile abilities. I think it, I guess we could just sum that up by saying it improves brain activity and possibly thinking. Yeah, it certainly seems like it from the things that we, we were just reading. So we know that learning to write in cursive is important. Uh, what tips do you have for teaching cursive? Well, you know, in the first half, I talked about some styles of manuscript um, printing that segue nicely into cursive writing. And one of them is Denelian. Um, it was developed in the 1970s by a man named Donald Neil Thurber. And it's called the Original Continuous Stroke Handwriting Program. Um, and what that means is that in the printed, in the manuscript form, children learn to actually slant their letters and they have, the, the printed letters have little curves to them. And then all they have to do to transition from manuscript to cursive is to learn a few basic connecting strokes. And then the next thing you know, they're writing in cursive. It's a very easy and painless way to get kids to do cursive writing. And it's similar to with uh, the Getty Dubé Italic program, where you learn the printed letters and they have a slight slant, and then you add some connecting strokes and boom, cursive. cursive now, writing. yeah, was that similar to Handwriting Without Tears, the one that you liked so well? It is very similar. It's the whole thing of some of those letters have, well, my kids called them tails. <laughs> and then you would connect that tail to the upstroke of the next letter and very similar. And what we appreciated about those, all of the curriculum you mentioned, actually, is that the, the printed letters and the cursive letters did resemble each other. And so there weren't, there are a few letters that don't look anything like their manuscript counterpart. But the way that the program was introduced, you could see where the the final product, how it had come from the printed letter. So mm -hmm. like the letter S, for example, depending on which program you're using, sometimes that S doesn't look anything like the S that you print, but the kids were able to make that connection. Some of our letters don't really look like the printed ones. And so that was another thing to learn, but because for some reason that learning to write in cursive was such a carrot. They were ready to like do all the things to be able to write in grown up handwriting. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, the program I'm using now, A Reason for Writing, um, it's ball and stick and then it goes into cursive. And in the 
the lessons, it shows similarities between the printed and the cursive forms. But I know when we get to Q, mm -hmm. I'm going to get some crazy <laughs> looks. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and G doesn't really look like a like a G that we print. Um, but again, it's it's something that is easily learned and it becomes kind of fun uh, to replicate. Right now, we've only just gotten a, a few lessons into the cursive and capital E and lowercase e weren't too bad and, and I and lowercase i weren't too bad. Now we're on O, which is really cinchy. But I, I know I'm going to get a few side eyes when we get to some of the more challenging ones. Right. And I know for my kids, we learned the correct way. And then they made modifications like most people do. The kind of the thing that makes your handwriting distinctive, as long as I knew what they meant. But uh, we did sometimes run into trouble with too many bumps on the M or the N or was that a W or a U or a B? <laughs> and mm -hmm. it was just part of learning. Yes. Yes. One of the basic things about it is that you just stay consistent. Kids are going to complain and they're going to find some of it hard and they're going to try to find a way to get out of it. But it's that everyday small amount of practice that leads to the finished product and then finding ways they can use it. Like you said, how comforting it was to receive some handwritten notes. Grandparents and aunts and uncles would love to receive some handwritten notes. And here we are coming towards the holidays when your children can help write addresses on the envelopes for Christmas cards if you send them. Now, I know a lot of people are sending electronic things, but maybe while your children are learning cursive, you kind of switch over and do some old fashioned things in the mail to help them find a reason to use this penmanship that you're telling them is important to use. Oh, you know, recently my daughter received a box of mementos from my mother-in-law. One of my brother-in-laws, you know, was trying to get it to our family and she was going through it, sending us pictures of my mother-in-law kept all the little notes. And Aww. so it has been so fun to see that uh, things that they sent to her and things that she kept and those handwritten mementos, those are the kind of things that you hang on to. Indeed. In fact, I had an experience like that myself just uh, yesterday. My sister and her husband bought a new home and it's smaller than the one they were living in. So she's been, um, I joked with her, I said, are you doing Swedish death cleaning? <laughs> which, is, which is what down. she's doing. She's, you know, really culling her items down. And she sent me a little New Testament. It was very old. And when I opened it, um, on the inside was written, Mr. E.J. Abraham. Well, that, uh, and it was in a, a cursive handwriting, that was my great-grandfather, whom I have never met. Oh. And here in this very old little New Testament, in what I would suspect is his handwriting, because I know my grandmother, his daughter's handwriting, is his signature. And I just felt like that was such a treasure. You know, it wouldn't, probably wouldn't be the same if it had just been like a little type piece of paper. Right. Or like your little address, return address labels that we stick in things. <laughs> right. Right. Because it was so it was so personal. It actually brought me to tears to see that. Now, there is something really personal about your cursive signature. Mm -hmm. Some people actually have trouble with the physical act of writing. And, and that's a an issue called dysgraphia. And so we don't want to cut those people off from being able to communicate. And so um, it's really important also to teach another way to write, and that would be um, typing and keyboarding. What do you think about that, Melody? Oh, that's exactly what I did for uh, one of my children who can write as far as compositions, but hates penmanship. And so I realized that, that when he was, oh, I don't know, junior high age, that typing and keyboarding were going to be important if I wanted to get any kind of compositions from him. And so we went from, you know, very super short little uh, handwritten paragraphs to very long fleshed out ones if I let him do it on the keyboard. So I looked around for, um, I mean, kind of at the same time, found some, my goodness, I think it was probably some sort of software for typing, like a typing instruction program. And we just made that part of our school day so that they could learn touch typing. Um, that's going to I feel like that's a really important skill now. So much of communication does happen online or you need to be able to send information digitally and you can't wait for a letter to get there in the mail. 
And so we just made that keyboarding part of our day. Yeah, and I agree with you that so much of our communication is through a keyboard or even on um, on our phones, you know, and you have to be able to understand how to find the different symbols you want and how to use them and, you know, um, recognize where things are because it's very laborious, the hunt and peck, very laborious and takes so long. It's not an efficient method at all if you if you don't understand where things are on the keyboard. So um, aside from people with dysgraphia and, and being able to communicate online, what other reasons is it important, do you think, for teaching typing and keyboarding skills? For, for one example, um, like right now I'm teaching a class in composition and middle school English, and I am requiring the children to turn in some of their papers as hard copies typed up with the correct MLA format. So that is one reason. It's going to be a skill that you need because we're preparing for college. And when I was in college, we had to turn all of our papers in typed. Or back then, it was like you had to be typed on a typewriter. But now, of course, we have wonderful word programs where we can uh, have those printed out. But I remember somebody, I made some money typing papers up for people who did not have those keyboarding skills. Wow. That's pretty cool. So it could be like a job on the side. But I just think we need to be able to, you need to be able to know how to type, type up a paper, type up an article. Even if that's not your thing, there are going to be times in life when you need to type up a written piece. Well, yeah. And in the workforce, um, people have to type reports and Mm -hmm. um, send email. Goodness, I get some really, really sad looking email. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad you mentioned that because my my son's job, the one who didn't like writing with a pencil, involves a lot of email and a lot of reports and things like that. So that keyboarding skill came in really handy for him. And then I have a, a relative who works in an office and has a coworker who doesn't have the skills. And it's kind of sad because mm-hmm. she just doesn't know how to format a letter or how to communicate effectively, the, you know, online with the emails and typing but we don't want to neglect that for our own children right and some jobs actually have a requirement that you can type so many words per minute i wasn't sure if that was still a requirement it definitely was when i was working in offices but um yeah depending on the position the that is sometimes part of the requirement for that job so typing and keyboarding is just as important as any other form of of written communication well, let's talk a little bit about teaching methods for keyboarding and, and typing. I um, I think I mentioned before we used, I think it was Typing Instructor that I found back back way back in the day uh, on a CD, you know. But um, Oh, yeah. <laughs> which we, we loved because it had the typing lessons and then games that you played to practice your, you know, correct. If you had your hands in the right place, you could do it fast and hit the fish before it got the something or other. Anyway, it was a bunch of games on there, which we used for practice. But you mentioned you had found something for Liam. Um, Well, we haven't started keyboarding for him just yet, but there is a website called typing.com, which I think has free um, instructions. And then um, Mavis Beacon teaches typing is still a thing. That's Um, a classic. I I know. I think it's all online. And the games are really a great way to get young kids started with keyboarding because they learn to put their fingers on the keyboard and then they can do things like shoot uh, rockets or things. And my son is now playing, um, he's done a lot of online gaming where he plays Roblox and he plays Minecraft. And so he is frustrated because he his spelling skills need to improve, obviously, but um, he can't type stuff into the chat. Whereas other people are typing things all the time, like his friends, and they'll say, tell that person something, whatever. And he'll say to his friends, well, I'm not really good at that right now. So I know that the time has come to uh, to add in some consistent practice for him. Isn't it interesting how the game is is uh, providing the motivation to really learn how to keyboard? Right. I think I will have um, a lot less resistance than if I said, oh, Okay, well, we're going to start practicing typing. Woohoo! You're going to put your fingers here and do this and that. But if I explain to him, hey, this is going to help you to do this thing much better, I think I'm going to have a, a lot more of a good attitude. 
Oh, I bet so. Help him, help him be more, uh, more able to communicate in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I want him to be online even more, <laughs> but you have to use what you can to get what you want done, I suppose. True. And this generation of children are growing up with devices. And so it's kind of I'm starting to notice it's kind of like if you don't learn how to hold your pencil correctly in the beginning, it has some problems for you later on. If you don't start out learning that touch typing, it just makes it harder later on if you're if you're stuck with hunt and pick. Some people are pretty fast at that, but it's never as efficient as uh, learning to touch type. Exactly. And and also I've noticed that um, there are different things you can do with a keyboard that I don't no, like I've learned them over time because they weren't a thing when you learned typing. Um, so there are different, you know, keyboard shortcuts and things that your kids can learn and that will be useful for them. And so it'll just make their work life much easier. And their, uh, if they go to dual enrollment or like you said, kids are taking classes with you at an enrichment academy and you're requiring typing. It's just really a good thing to not make your kids have to catch up but you know, get ahead of the curve. Right, and even this past year with everyone having to go online for classes, I'm sure that the students needed more typing skills. And so we just never know when we might need those skills. That's true, that's true. And so finding a way to do it that is um, palatable to the kids is really important. You'll get a much more receptive student. Here at the end of our podcast, we find ourselves once again in the reading nook where we discuss the books on our minds and bedside tables. What are you reading right now, Holly? Well, I'm still uh, reading through Catherine's Heart, which is a really long book. And someday I'll, I'll have a review for everybody. But I'll tell you what has kind of got me curious and interested is um, our, our listeners might remember we talked about Kendra Adachi's book, The Lazy Genius Way. And we've implemented some of her um, techniques, but guess what? She's got a new book coming out. It's supposed to publish in March of 2022. And it's called The Lazy Genius Kitchen. Have what you need, use oh. what you have, and enjoy it like never before. And I'm like, holler. <laughs> I want I, to get that book. <laughs> oh, me too, because I'm fixing to move and I bet I'll get some really good ideas out of there. And yeah, it's going to have a sneak peek. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I actually ran into it on Amazon and you can pre-order it for hardcover or Kindle. And if you have Audible, it's free with an Audible trial. But we have to wait until March of March oh, 22nd wow. of 2022. Oh, my goodness. Waiting. Well, I've had to wait on the book that I'm reading right now. I only just got it last night. We we watched the series Virgin River on Netflix which was Love that really show. good. Oh, it's so good. And um, oh. it's based on books. And so I w was able to find the book on our overdrive with our library has overdrives. I found the books. Of course, you have to wait till somebody finishes reading. And I got the first three pretty quickly. But I've been waiting for about two months for somebody to turn oh. in book four. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, no, that's so weird. It's an electronic service, but you still only have one person reading it at a time I don't understand yes, I don't it either. <laughs> <laughs> it'll say you're number two on 13 copies or something it's like I don't know how that works but I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and last night popped up in my email and then I stayed up way too late <laughs> reading oh so I've been waiting fun. so long um and so the books um include some things that they didn't put in the series i mean you know books and movies yeah. are never the same but yeah. it's still good really good and just really enjoying uh the reading that's awesome um yeah I, I think i recently found out that it was from a series of books and i thought oh man now i have to get those books <laughs> that's one of those things i really like if i can't get it the actual physical book at the library, which I still really like picking up a book and reading it. Um, at least my my Kindle reader is kind of like a book. <laughs> a oh, yeah. And so I can get those books and I'm never late turning them in because they just, you know, take them. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I've, I've had um, some fines on returning books to the library and um, 
Yeah, that's not pleasant, except that my library gives us a chance to pay off our fines by donating food in November. So I'm going to donate a bunch uh, of non-perishable items and uh, I call it food for fines or something like that. So. I think that's really clever. I just love that. I do too. Well, I, I've got to get that series now. If you have any questions, comments, or book recommendations, please email us at happyhomeschoolpod at gmail.com. Like our page and join our group on Facebook at facebook.com slash happyhomeschoolpod. Check out our Instagram at instagram.com slash happyhomeschoolpod. Follow us on Twitter at underscore homeschoolpod. And subscribe to the Happy Homeschooler podcast on YouTube. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Melody. I'm Holly. Happy, Happy homeschooling. homeschooling. Hi, this is your host, Melody Gillum. Thank you for listening to the Happy Homeschooler podcast, a transcript maker production. My co-host is Holly williams Erbach. This episode was produced by Matthew Bass and edited by Nora Williams. Our graphic design is by Pete Soloway, and our music is by The Great Pangolin. You can find our music on YouTube and Twitter at Kylie Wins. That's K-A-I-L-E-Y Wins. If you'd like to help our podcast grow, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or, as always, tell people about us. Um, I'll just wait a minute for the train to go by. <laughs> I wondered if y'all could hear that. <laughs>